Um, so it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Suisa Schulte-Zor, who's visiting us from Iowa State University, not Ohio State University, exactly. Idaho, um, where she's been a professor for the last 12 years. And so prior to that, she earned her PhD in forestry from the University of Wisconsin and her master's from the University of Minnesota. So her research, as you saw yesterday, came to the talk, uh, is sort of located at the intersection between humans and their use of landscapes, but that's a pretty broad definition. Um, and it's actually and it's actually kind of difficult to get a little more specific than that because Lisa <laughs> studies such a broad array of topics as, you'll, as you're gonna see today. So she studies everything from soil ecology and chemistry to the community ecology of insects and birds, all the way up to apply innovative policies for land use and conservation within agriculture. So um, I think we're going to get to see that today. Her talk is titled Prairie Scripts from Research to Action. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Moore. Our crop fields. 
and it's expected that sustainable soil loss is somewhere more in the range of 0.5 tons per acre per year. So it's not sustainable from a soil perspective, and yet we know these soils are the foundation of agriculture itself. So that leads to some questions about how we can do better in this regard. And also it's um, pretty challenging when it comes to things like extreme rainfall <laughs> events. This is the city of Cedar Rapids after 2008 when there was a massive flood. You should all care about this because it cost the taxpayers of the United States $4 billion to rebuild um, the city of Cedar Rapids after this extreme flood event. And since 1993, there's been three 500-year flood events in Iowa. So that doesn't quite add up. <laughs> Clearly, there's a land use issue in addition to um, a climate signature that's affecting this pattern. And lastly, um, we've seen really dramatic declines in our native biota. Um, it's estimated based on the state wildlife action plan that about a third of Iowa species won't make it in the next century unless we make, um, unless we actively try to manage for their population. So when you're talking about a third of species, you know, it's not just the rare stuff, but it ends up being some really common stuff as well, like the monarch butterfly, which is now in a precipitous population decline, the, the uh, my, eastern migrating population. There's enough uh, precipitous um, population decline. And anybody that has lived in the Midwest for a uh, part of your life, you know that monarch butterflies should be really common, right? But um, not so much anymore. So clearly there's things that we need to work on. And the big question on the SWIFT project that we're trying to answer, we recognize Iowa will be an agricultural state. It makes a lot of sense for it to be so long into the future. We're going to continue to produce. Um, but how do we achieve a suite of conservation goals along with our productive agricultural system? And can we do this on the same acres? That's kind of the big question that we're trying to ask. And there's a hypothesis that is the foundational to the research that we have going on here. We call it the Strategic Integration and Disproportionate Benefits Hypothesis. And we've written a couple uh, review papers reviewing the literature that support this. And um, the idea is that if you are in an annually dominated landscape like we are, where there's mostly just annual plants, one, or one species that's only active for a part of the, of the year that you see when you drive across Iowa, either corn or soybean. When you have a landscape like that, interjecting perennials, so perennial plants, um, even at small amounts, can have a dramatic impact on the amount of environmental benefits that are produced from that landscape. So the idea that as we interject more perennials, we're going to get more benefits, but at some, at some point, you know, there's an asymptote here, and what we're trying to find is where that asymptote is in the, in the research. And one of the projects that we have testing that hypothesis is the STRIPS project. And I'm going to talk about, first of all, our STRIPS 1 experiment, and then secondly talk about now we're in phase 2. So we have a STRIPS 2 experiment. Our first project um, we conducted starting in 2007 at the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge, um, where the refuge was converting from agricultural land to uh, the, the mission of the, of the refuge is to restore Iowa's native ecosystems. But they can only do a little bit every year. And so they had some land that they were renting to neighboring farmers. Um, to maintain as, as crops. And um, we approached them about locating the study here. And it made a lot of sense to them because eventually these fields will be converted back to prairie. But um, they had some, um, they were in brome and they had some invasive species concerns. So they were looking at converting to row crops as a way to manage their invasive species concerns on these watersheds. And they really want to try to speak to the farming populations that surround the refuge. So they really were embracing this idea of trying to strategically integrate, in this case, you know, reconstructed tall grass prairie in agricultural fields. It made sense with their mission. And certainly when we started talking about this project way back in 2003, the idea of putting prairie in crop fields was so odd. <laughs> 
it was so strange that we, we wouldn't have been able to um, locate this experiment on Iowa State University land. Now we have um, prairie integrated with row crops on Iowa State University land, but back then it was, it was much too novel. And the refuge was a great uh, partner in terms of proof of concept. So <coughs> on the refuge, we had 12 small agricultural catchments that we could use to devote to the experiment. They are truly not that big, between 0.4 and 3.2 hectares in size. In terms of slopes, they're between 6 and 11 percent slope. So for those of you that come to a mountainous region, that's not much of a slope, but for us in, uh, in agricultural regions, this is much, a pretty significant slope for row crops. Um, 12 watersheds, we use a randomized incomplete block design, and here are our treatments. The first, um, this is representing the catchment. The first of the treatments was what people usually do, which is a corn soy rotation, 100% row crop. In our second treatment, we integrated in the prairie, um, but we put it all at the base of that catchment, and it represented 10% of that total catchment area. In the next case, it was again 10% prairie, but instead of having it all at that foot slope position, we had multiple strips running on the contour, so we spread it out. And then a 20% prairie uh, prairie treatment. So three um, <coughs> replicates of each of those treatments. And what we chose in terms of treatment was prairie. That wasn't necessarily um, an immediate decision, but something that the team had to talk about. Um, we talked about some of the more commonly used uh, perennial covers that are already used on farms, like smooth brome. Um, we had some people talking about using hybrid uh, willows or potentially even um, incorporating in um, hazelnuts as a high value oil crop. Um, but we settled on prairie and I made this point last night and I want to make it again because it's really important for those of you that don't think about structure function relationships on a day to day basis that you know, the reason that we chose prairie is because we expected it to provide the most function. So if you're gonna take a little bit of area and put it into perennials, we wanted to try to pick the plant community that would provide the greatest amount of function, and prairie made sense. So prairie, why prairie? <laughs> so um, it's Iowa's native ecosystem, um, so it is adapted to our soils, it is adapted to our climate, um, and our native biota are adapted to it. Plus it has these characteristics of being diverse, um, so it does well in dry years and it does well in wet years. It, the plants have stiff upright stems. Given that we are locating these on the contour, we wanted something that would slow down and impede the flow of water rather than just bending over and letting the water run off, which is what smooth brome does. Great in a grass waterway situation, not what we wanted in that prairie strip type situation where we wanted to slow the water down. And it has really dense uh, root, root networks that help um, hold soil in place. So these functional attributes, or these structural attributes of prairie made it the best candidate in terms of trying to um, integrate it in and receive those disproportionate environmental benefits. And it's pretty. <laughs> That's the other thing, it's pretty. <laughs> we undervalue that sometimes. What did we plant? Um, in this case, our initial planting was 32 native species. It was, it was seed that was collected on other areas of the refuge. We did seed analysis. We know that there were 31 uh, native perennial species in that seed mix. In that initial fall, um, when we collected the seed, we also added um, uh, golden alexanders because we wanted to have a, a bloom uh, visible in the prairie throughout the whole gr growing season. That's really important to fostering habitat for our beneficial insects. And then later we uh, added also Canada anemone again to try to get a, another flower that was blooming in the spring of the year when our beneficial insects really are in the general landscape that they're depauperate in terms of floral resources. We sowed those in uh, July of 2007. It wasn't the ideal time, but it was when we could get the work done. Sometimes experiments end up that way. Uh, by 2011, we found 39 native perennial species growing in the strips. Uh, where did the other ones come from? 
you know, potentially, we don't know for sure. <laughs> Maybe they were in the seed mix and we didn't identify them through the seed analysis. Maybe they came from the seed bank. Um, maybe they were you know, blown in or moved by animals from other parts of the refuge. But the, the big thing is, is that we were finding lots of, of our native perennial species that we wanted to establish here within you know, three and a half years in, in our prairie strip. So it's by sort of plant composition, by percent cover, um, so more than 100% because of course some of the canopies are overlapping, we had established at least what visually looked like a prairie on, on, in these, in these uh, watersheds. And here's another picture where you can kind of see what that looks like. In terms of the crop ground, um, it's, the crop ground is managed by a local farmer who manages the crops just like he does the crops on his own farm. And uh, with the... Oh. <laughs> With the um, one change that because we're working on a wildlife refuge, he can only use glyphosate in terms of, of uh, herbicide, and he can't use pesticide. Um, so there's that one ramification, but um, or that one stipulation. But other than that, he manages the crops the way he manages his own crop, and we use no-till soil techniques. So for those of you um, that aren't involved in agriculture, no-till is the best. Uh, soil management property that you, or soil management that you would use. There's other ways that people manage soil that involve tillage, uh, strip till, um, or minimum tillage, but no-till is the, the best uh, soil manager. That's an important point. <laughs> um, and we try, to basic, we try to basically measure the pulse of what's going on in these watersheds. We have really in-depth uh, scientific monitoring of especially water processes, and in terms of biodiversity, we've looked at plants, uh, insects, and, and birds, as well as the crops themselves. And here's kind of what it looks like in terms of one of those, those catchments with our H food um, at the bottom. For those of you that don't do hydrology, we're able to collect all of the runoff that's um, running off this slope and then collect water samples that we can then analyze for sediment and nutrients and um, even pesticides and herbicides. Those kind of in terms of results, we've been really productive. Um, so early on, it was you know some of the review papers that we were publishing. Here's a big, uh, we see lots of this early on students finishing up, and then they eventually publish their theses as as papers. Um, and then more recently, we've been producing outreach material because farmers have been asking for that. Um, you know, how do we do this on our on our fields, um, and so there's kind of been a, a succession, so to speak, in terms of the scientific product. I show this graph um, because I'm going to hit on some of the research highlights here. You could give a 45-minute talk on each individual aspect of the disciplinary aspects of strips, and I'm going to give you an overview talk here. You'll see the citations for the papers in the lower left-hand corner, so if anybody's interested in any of the specifics, um, we, can, we can provide you with those papers. Um, but realize that even though I'm hitting the highlights, um, most of this work has been published in the peer-reviewed literature already. And as I shared with you last night, some of our, our data from the runoff component, the, the hydrological um, Runoff component has been sort of the most dramatic and certainly has caught the attention of both farmers and policymakers, uh, both state and nationally. And it can be summarized fairly well in, in these three pictures. And what you're seeing here is uh, the, the flumes after a four inch rain event in June of 2008. And remember that by this time, uh, we had sowed the prairie in 2007. And so this is just the year after we sowed the prairie. The prairie had yet to really fully establish in terms of its root system. And certainly some of the more conservative species that we planted hadn't even expressed itself at this time. Um, you can see that despite that, <laughs> despite the fact that in, in the first year we had a really just a weedy patch. Um, that translates into quite a bit of function. <laughs> um, so even though no-till uh, soil management is the best of the best soil uh, management that you get in row crop systems, still when you're on a 6 to 10, 11% slope, there's a lot of soil that's going to be on the move. 
as represented in this boom picture right here. And indeed, sometimes we even pick like whole corn plants out of the flume. <laughs> they have, you know, moved with the, the soil um, down slope. Um, and then certainly just 10% prairie strips makes a big impact, uh, you can see, on the, on the water. And, but it's not as good as what 100% prairie would provide. And this, isn't, this picture isn't our experiment, but it was another catchment on the refuge that did have 100% prairie. So we took a picture of that one um, in that year. The numbers that go along with these that have been really consistent over time, and we've measured this in early on and we measured it later, we've measured it in rain years, and we've measured it in pretty dry years, these overall numbers tend to be quite consistent. And what we see is that with this 10% prairie uh, strip solution, or well, we don't really see separation between 10% uh, all at the foot slope or 10% on the contour or the 20%. It's the big difference is anything that has a little bit of prairie and the catchments that have no prairie. Um, so statistically, we don't generally separate out the, the three other treatments. Um, but what we see is that with that 10% prairie, um, we're able to keep 95% more soil up in that catchment. We're not losing it to external ecosystems. Along with that soil, we're keeping 90% more phosphorus up there, 84% more nitrogen, and we're seeing less runoff overall. And in, it's 44% less runoff overall when we get the 10% uh, prairie strip solution. So in terms of disproportionate benefits, <laughs> you take a little bit of area and you put it in the prairie strips and you get this dramatic benefit in terms of uh, these water, water properties. We've also looked at groundwater. Um, we've seen a reduction in uh, the amount of nitrate, which is a really um, key water pollutant in this area of the world. Um, we see a 70% reduction in the, in the nitrate levels in groundwater when you have that 10% prairie strip as opposed to 100% row crop. And, this work, we, we published an uh, early study in 2010 uh, that was suggestive of a trend, but we need to write up these results now, so uh, now that we have more data. Um, and so th this publication will be coming, but just so you see this. Um, so these are our three treatments. You can see that there's not a lot of separation depending on whether, you know, the three different treatments. But, you know, the, the row crop, 100% row crop, you're seeing not only higher levels of nitrate, but that it's um, gone up over, over time. And in terms of water quality, the EPA drinking water standard is 10 parts uh, per million, or um, 10 milligrams per liter. Um, and so the, the areas in 100% in rural crops are now approaching that, that water, EPA water quality standard. So pretty cool, <laughs> I think. <laughs> We've also looked at some of the biogeochemi biogeochemistry and soil processes. What we saw, and this is initial data as well, is that within that foot slope position, so right above the flume, we see that the soil quality there is improving and it can improve very quickly. Um, we see it, an increase in the total amount of nitrogen in that soil, increased by 100%. So instead of allowing that nitrogen to run out of the ecosystem, we're capturing it in that prairie strip, we see an increase in soil organic carbon by 37%. Prairie is awesome, but it's not that awesome in terms of carbon accrual. Um, what's happening here is that we're capturing the soil from upslope that has carbon associated with it in that prairie strip. And that's where we're seeing the carbon, most of the carbon increases are just coming from that erosion process. We're capturing the carbon in that soil. Over time, we would expect, you know, also that those prairie roots to contribute more carbon below ground. Um, but most of this is just associated with capturing um, that erosion, that soil erosion in the prairie strip. And um, we've also looked at greenhouse gas emissions. And in this foot slope position, we're able to re reduce nitrous oxide emissions by 75%. So does anybody know how nitrous oxide compares to say, we talk more about carbon dioxide. Um, how does nitrous oxide compare to um, carbon dioxide in terms of greenhouse gas forcing? Does anybody know? It's more than 90%. Yeah. 
More than what? Sorry? More than 90 times. Yeah, yeah. In fact, it's even more than that. 126. Oh, <laughs> so precise. I like it. It's actually more like 300 percent or 300 times. Um, so, seeing significant reduction in nitrous oxide emission is 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 pretty. I mean, 75 percent is is really pretty dramatic. We've also looked at, I said, mentioned um, insect diversity, both the natural enemy population and the pollinators. We know that the prairie strips don't pro foster um, at least soybean aphids, <laughs> which are a, a key agricultural pest in this area. Um, they may uh, foster some of the pests associated with, with corn. We haven't seen that ha it had a yield effect on the corn next to the prairie. That's one of the things that we're going to continue to research. We haven't been able to either translate this increase in insect diversity to reduction of pest populations within, within the, the crop areas. That's one of the things that we looked at. We thought, well, you know, these native communities, they'll provide lots of habitat resources. They'll provide a refuge to some of the beneficial insects. You know, that could translate into a yield benefit to the farmers, either potentially um, with the pollinators um, providing a pollination benefit to soybean or by reducing the, the pest pressure, so reducing soybean aphid pe pest pressure. We weren't able to tease that out in strips one, and one of the reasons we think that we weren't is because, again, we're located in a wildlife refuge. So even though there's more insects in the prairie strips, there's lots of insects <laughs> all throughout the watersheds um, uh, because you know, we have this landscape that's just great habitat for, for the beneficial insects. So we haven't been able to tease that out yet. Certainly in phase two, that's one thing that we want to look at a lot further. Um, and we've also shown an uh, increase in both bird richness and abundance. Statistically, we've been able to tease out increases in eastern kingbird, American robin, um, common yellowthroat and song sparrow populations. We also see some species of greatest conservation need, like dick sussels, as pictured here, and um, meadowlarks, uh, field sparrows, using the prairie strips. We weren't able to statistically tease out um, their use. Again, we're in a wildlife refuge, so there's lots of source populations. And um, this is one of those things that, again, we really want to uh, research more fully in phase two when we're in more typical Iowa landscapes that don't have as much, you know, really great um, habitat surrounding, surrounding the experimental areas. So that's an area. This work was suggestive, but I'm really excited about phase two. And important to farmers, we were able to show that there's no in per acre influence on crop yield. So there, we don't show a competition between the prairie plants and the crops that are next door. Um, so that would be bad if the, the farmers went out there and they saw a dip <laughs> in the corn height right next to the prairie plants. They would not like to see that. We didn't see that, and we showed that we don't create any additional weed issues for the farmers either, which from their standpoint, um, you know, weeds are, are bad. They can have an economic impact on their, on their yield. We also looked at the, uh, the prairie strips as a potential source of biomass, and we've showed that the harvested prairie bi biomass yields about 3.1 tons per acre, which is kind of like switchgrass, not very well-managed switchgrass in this, in this region. We're very interested in, you know, whether these prairie strips can provide feedstocks for bioenergy production. So that's why this measure is important. Um, in this case, there's no market for the prairie strips material, but Gary, our farmer, um, is also a cattle guy, and he was very appreciative of getting this material as bedding for his cows. So even though it's not, you know, like a, a market, you know, he was able to offset some of his costs by um, having this material. We uh, ran the economics on it, and in comparison to other conservation practices that farmers might consider adopting, it's, a, it's a, an affordable um, option. It costs about 29 cents a linear foot to establish these prairie strips if you monetize it over a 15-year horizon. In comparison, a terrace, which is the commonly used practice to hold soil in place, costs about, in this county at least, about $4 per acre, or per square, or per, 
$4 per linear foot. So it's an order of magnitude cheaper than sort of the standard conservation practice that people would use in the setting. And in terms of um, treating it on an acre scale, it costs even more precisely than this, um, 25 to $34 per acre, per treated acre to install the prairie strip. If the farmer also receives conservation reserve payments through the USDA programs, that out-of-pocket cost can be reduced to $3 per treated acre. So it's, you know, it's, I'm not saying it's not nothing, <laughs> but um, it's, a, it's one of the affordable options if a farmer wanted to look at conservation on their, on their farms. Just kind of one of the summary graphics, um, and we're going to update this one soon. But comparing all of these metrics, when we um, place the prairie strips on, on a field, we are taking some of the land out of crops and we're putting it in the prairie. So that's going to be, you know, a yield dip, right? And it's just the yield dip of taking that land out and putting it into the prairie. And it's, you know, if it's a 10% prairie strip solution, it's 10% yield loss. Um, but, or it potentially could be 10% yield loss. But at the same time, for that yield loss, there's all sorts of benefits that are also accrued. Some of them, which could be, you know, privately uh, retained. So certainly all farmers are interested in retaining their soil. That's their capital. Um, but certainly they've also paid for these nutrients and they want to keep those in their field. Putting it on a different metric because these are uh, proportion of where these are multipliers, but we see an increase in, in bird and, and plant biodiversity. Plant biodiversity is no surprise. We planted those, but it's cool that the other, the other organisms come along with that. Very conservatively, um, we've tried to estimate you know, some of the economics associated with this, and <laughs> we plan to update this. Um, using some non-market valuation in the future, but very conservatively, we've just uh, estimated what it ta takes Des Moines Water Works, which is the state's largest water treatment plant, how much it costs them to remove these, um, these pollutants once they're in, in uh, the river water um, and to clean, purify it for drinking water. And so very conservatively, we've estimated that for every dollar that a farmer or society invests in prairie strips, it generates uh, oh, sorry, um, $8.60 in environmental benefits from the standpoint of water purification for drinking water. So that's a pretty decent return on investment, and especially given that we haven't yet monetized all of the other environmental benefits that go along with the prairie strip. What we hear um, from farmers, they're more and more interested, uh, farmers all the time, on applying this on their own farms, which we're really excited about, having researched and developed a technology that you know, now farmers want to put it on their own farms. And what they tell us is they, they really see prairie strips as a practical option uh, for their farm. And for anybody that works with farming populations, that's like the best endorsement you can get. <laughs> it's, it, I think it's practical. OK, great. Um, and uh, another thing they talk about is that we can, um, that you know, in comparison to other options they might try, like cover crops, it doesn't, they're ma they know they have to manage the prairie strip, but it doesn't m interfere with the timing of management when they have to manage, you know, when they have to be paying attention to their cash crops. So they can, you know, install the prairie strips in the fall. Um, they have to manage it in the summer, but their really big crunch times are in the spring when they're planting, and then in the fall during harvest. And they they don't need to manage the prairie strips during those times. So there's no competition with their labor, um, and that's a really big deal. The other thing is that we can design these to try to minimize the conflict with tractor movement. Um, another big deal, since farmers don't like, you know, turning their tractors very often. Um, and uh, the big thing is, is it addresses some of their other goals that they have for their farm that aren't necessarily yield. Um, so yield is a big deal, but so is maintaining soils. And, um, you know, every farmer has their own, own goals. They may have wildlife goals. They may have water quality goals. 
um, and they might just have beauty goals, um, and they see Prairie Strips as addressing those goals for their fund. So that's pretty cool. The other thing that we've done is we did a statewide survey asking Iowa residents what were their priorities for our state's um, agricultural policies and programs such that you know, if we're going to invest in agriculture, where, as a state, where do we want to put those investments? And so this is surveying both rural and um, urban populations. And this is what people told us. And um, is there anything that strikes you from these survey results? Remember, the question was about priorities for agricultural programs and policies. Try to make this a little bit engaging. <laughs> Crop production is almost flat. Yeah, exactly. So the question was about agriculture, but yet the thing that we think about is, you know, it was number nine. Um, the key goals in the state, a lot, everybody is concerned about water. And when you look at the, you know, four of these top five all have to do with water. <coughs> and certainly drinking water quality is really important as well. For those of you that are like me and really care about things like birds, um, <laughs> we rank lower than crop production. So that's the bad news. Um, but I'm OK with it. There, you know, people really want these things. Um, and so the big message I want you to get from this is that you know, we're at the sweet spot here, where farmers are telling us they think that prairie strips are a practical op opportunity or option for their farm. And you know, society, at least in our state, is telling us that the kind of things that prairie strips can produce are what they value for the future of agricultural policies and programs. So that's, for us, that's really exciting. And that is what has led us to phase two, which is being able to do research and demonstration on commercial farms across Iowa. Um, not only is it awesome to have willing landowners that want to devote a portion of their property to doing research and demonstration on something that's pretty new, um, but it's also, you know, it, we've developed the societal support that helps to fund the research that we want to do as well. I mean, society is asking for more of this kind of thing, which is if you're running, you know, a research program, we all need funding. And so that's been really important too. We're now working on 25 farms. This is our initial research site at the Neil Smith Natural Wildlife Refuge. We're now working on 25 sites across the state of Iowa and northern Missouri. There's um, some pretty big technical challenges to try to run an experiment over this broad of an area, um, which I'll tell you about in a little bit here. Um, in the second phase of research, we've kind of, in terms of what we're recommending to people, we're starting out with that 10% strips configuration. We're recommending that, you know, start with a, considering that for your farm, and then we'll work with you in terms of, you know, what your soil type is, what your slope is, you know, how you need to move your equipment through your field. Um, but that's where we start the conversation at least. And so basically in the second phase, we're trying to put, you know, air bars on, on that part of this, this graphic. Um, in the first phase, we didn't see a lot more benefit from 20% as opposed to 10%. So we've kind of focused on that. Could we go with less? That's always a question <laughs> that we get from farmer audiences. We don't know, but some of our implementations now um, in one case, it's a 4% um, um, deployment of prairie strips. So we hope to be able to answer that question a little bit more um, moving forward. And in the second phase of research, we're hoping to address all the questions that we get from farmers. <laughs> like, what about this situation? And what about this? What if I graze the field <laughs> after I you know, take the corn off? Or what if, do I need to burn the prairie strips? Can I just get away from, with mowing? What is going to be the impacts of you know, some of the different herbicides and pesticides that I use on my farm? All of these questions that farmers are now coming to us with, and we're like, ooh, <laughs> will you help us with the second phase of research? And hopefully you're really patient to work with researchers because that's what it takes. Um, so anyway, in our second phase, these are some of the things that we're, we're hoping to address. And one of the cool things about working with the populations we're working with, and that, you know, this is true any time that you get beyond, you know, highly controlled designed experiments, and are working with you know, people that are, whose lives are dependent on the land is that they're coming up with so many ideas themselves. And they're teaching us about 
how we could how we could better integrate this idea into farms and then they're convincing their neighbors that this is also a good idea for them so it's a two-way street in terms of learning and you know I always tell my farmers they're like oh you know it's so they're so appreciative oh you gave me this data from my farm it's so cool I have data from my farm I was like no it's so cool I've learned more from you than you you could possibly learn from me so it's a it's a really fun two-way street in terms of um, in terms of uh, those interactions just to give you a sense of what this looks like once you move out to the commercial environment, um, I'm giving you two examples that are different ranges in a spectrum. Um, this farm right here, it's a very gentle slope down to this drainage uh, ditch. Some people would call it a stream. Um, but in this case, um, you know, in this case, the farmer already had some conservation features here and with the grass waterway. And he was just really interested in slowing this water down a little bit more. Um, it's already, you know, it's not that steep. Um, he has an area that's never been tilled up here, and he has CRP land over here. So he's really also interested in creating a wildlife corridor um, for wildlife on, the, on this farm. And so we were able to design a prairie strip option that actually improved the farmability um, of this field because you can see that the strips gets a little wider out here so he has to do fewer tractor um, you know manipulations in this case over here this is a much more steeply sloped uh, field this is the summit position and it's sloping down sloping down this way in this case um, in this case the farmer didn't put this into uh, the CRP program in this case, the farmland owner and his, well, it's a, a set of three brothers, they really felt like they needed the federal CRP payments in order to make this happen. And because of that, they had to fit the federal standards and guidelines in terms of strip width and placement. And so the trade-off is, is I would not, I mean, it's really cool that they did the prairie strips, but I would not want to be these landowners farmers. <laughs> it's going to be really hard to move the tractor uh, in among these strips, especially when you get really um, narrow lanes like this. But just so you can kind of see what this looked like in the commercial farming environment, and um, certainly, you know, we're moving up in scale, you know, from that, you know, first phase where it was really small catchment between about one and, and uh, what was it, um, five hectares, to now we're working on fields that are, are 20, 40, in some cases, you know, 50 hectares in size. So we've really moved up in terms of uh, the size of area that we're working on. There's much less control once you start working on uh, private farms. And one of the things has been the seed mix. Um, we can't really control for that. It depends on what the farmer um, is willing to put in on their own, whether they want to try to work with the federal government in terms of cost share, if there's cost share available from other conservation organizations. And so in one case where a farmer was just really interested in you know, slowing down that water, he planted a, a 15 species mix. In another case, a farmer was really interested in trying to establish more wildness on his farm, and he planted a 150 species mix. So again, it's an order of magnitude in terms of you know, the divergence there, which makes it really challenging from a research perspective. And so the way that we're dealing with that is we've separated out our research sites into um, our in-depth monitoring ones, shown in, in red, where we have more control and uh, where we actually have a, treatment, a treatment and control portion to the fields. And then our other sites where we're trying to do basic monitoring to give the farmers and landowners some feedback on how the strips are functioning on their land, but we don't have that same level of scientific control, so we don't know you know, the extent that we're going to get a lot of really great papers out of that, <laughs> basically. But where we do have control, um, we, have a, we have these five sites that we are uh, managing our, ourselves and then a partner institution up in uh, the Iowa Great Lakes region um, developed their own funding to, to monitor that site. So there's partners coming forward to do, set up their own sites too, which is pretty cool. What kind of environmental benefits are we addressing? Uh, we're trying to, on those, those um, in-depth sites, we're trying to address everything that we did in our initial experiment. Um, on the, the out other basic farms, we can't do everything. We just can't get there in time. And so we're, we'll be able to give farmers at least some feedback on the ones that we have in, in bold here. And here's what 
for those that we can actually get some level of control. In this case, it's an Iowa State research farm where we've established a control field, you know, and randomized treatment, uh, treatment field here. We are able to establish the, the flumes again so we can get the water quality measurements. And um, we've added a, a herp um, component to it as well now. So um, we're, this is kind of what it looks like when you're, when you're looking at that more uh, controlled design. And as you can see, a much bigger uh, scale that we're addressing now. As I said, there's some technological hurdles with that. Because of that, we're using some new technology. Um, for those of you that study erosion processes, um, we're developing uh, the use of these erosion bags. We can use our, our data from our H flumes to calibrate the erosion rates associated with the sediment deposited on these erosion bags. But these are really cheap to deploy. They're like $4 a piece. So we can put them on private farms you know, wherever people are adopt, adopting the strips and give the farmers at least fee some feedback on whether their goals with regards to soil, maintaining their soils are being met. Um, in terms of the bird aspect, um, we're putting out automatic recording units where we only have to, they record for one hour every dawn, every day of the year. <laughs> so when you're talking about some research sites that are over three hours away, you know, um, we only have to visit these twice a year to replace the batteries and collect the cards. So it's a really affordable way to collect data, at least on presence, absence, or well, presence, to at least give the farmer some sense of the wildlife that are, are using these fields with the prairie strips. And here is what some of the sound recordings look like. And are there any birders in the room that can recognize that <laughs> signature? Anybody want to make a guess? <laughs> it's a really cool bird. <laughs> Metal arc. Uh, I thought about putting the metal arc up, but this one is an upland sandpiper. So, um, so yeah, we're recording some really cool uh, sounds, and we cannot not only necessarily get birds, but we get things like you know families of coyotes and and other things as well. Um, also, we're trying to get estimates of, of nest productivity. Our initial research sites, it was just too small to get enough nests to estimate fecundity associated with the birds. Um, and so it's really super labor intensive for anybody that, that does any bird nest work. Um, some of the technology we're employing are infrared cameras. You see two people, and here's a Vesper Sparrow nest um, to try to increase our ability to detect nests in, in, again, over really large acreages. And we can't afford to visit these sites as frequently since they're widely dispersed. And so when we do find nests, we put these little eye buttons, temperature recorders in them so that we have a better understanding of when uh, these different phases of um, nest development and nestling development happen. Here's some of the temperature data. These black lines are when we actually visited the site here, we're, we're right now in the stage of calibrating them. Eventually, we'll um, do fewer visits just because it's uh, so expensive. But you can see the different stages of nest development. If we hadn't had the I button, um, which shows when the temperature drops off, and this is just you know annual or daily cycles for, of hot during the day and cold at night, um, we visited here again, we would have said this nest would have failed. Um, because it got run over by a, a sprayer on the 3rd of June. Um, but we know from the I button data that the fledglings um, had fledged prior to um, when the tractor came with the sprayer. So it gets us better data, which are really important in developing the estimates of daily survival rate. So this is really cool stuff. Uh, watch for papers on this to be coming out soon. Um, we're also um, under better understanding of the socioeconomic aspects of it. And uh, just one example of this, um, a new paper coming out um, in conjunction with my colleague Emily Heaton, uh, a company in Ames Egg Solver, and then the Department of Energy, where we've looked at subfield profitability across the state of Iowa. And hopefully, we can use this information to help us site the prairie strips, so looking at the, the, the farmer's fields and understanding where their profits are great, where they have great yield, 
and where their profits are lower and trying to cite the prairie strips where profitability of that field is lower. Um, you can see we've looked, we've done a back cast over time. Corn was really profitable in these years, but still there's some areas at a subfield scale that are underperforming. Uh, market starting to turn here, and then by 2015, this matches what we find uh, here on the radio. Corn prices and soybean prices are way down, um, and farmers are looking for other options. But certainly in cases like this, we could use this information to help cite prairie strips. Farmers are, that farmer is losing a lot of, a lot of money on that acre, uh, or on these acres. The only way they're able to maintain profitability in the, on these farms in this situation is through federal crop insurance policies. So integrating in some of the social stuff. And here's the conclusion. <laughs> so hopefully I've convinced you that the work that we're doing is hypothesis-driven experimental research. Um, so you can do this kind of, you know, uh, really great science uh, research in, a, in a, an applied setting. Um, we're trying to develop system level understanding. So not just looking at water, not just looking at soil, not just looking at insects, but integrating this all together. And our research is both transdisciplinary, we're engaging farmers in it, and solutions oriented. We're trying to address the, the problems that the farmers are com coming forward with on their, on their own farms. Um, and then in terms of that initial hypothesis and our initial experiment at the refuge, we definitely were able to show that there is a disproportionate benefit with just putting that 10% prairie out there. Um, we are really curious about what levels we'll get now that we're mo we've moved to that commercial farming environment. And so my final take home is to stay tuned. <laughs> There's more to come. So thank you for your attention and that's all. Yeah.